Hello, Internet! I'm Elliot the Purple Artifice, and welcome to Buddy Reads, where we read a small selection of a book and review it for you. Today, we are covering chapters 5 and 6 of Artemis by Andy Weir. I hope you've read up to that point, because I do not want to ruin anything for you. So this section begins with Jazz chilling in her little coffin area, and she is reading the gossip rags while she is waiting for her HIB to be put into position. Because what I got wrong yesterday was I thought that she had already put it in position, but what she was really doing was just kind of getting it out into the moon sphere stuff so that it can ride the train to get into position. So it is right now on its way to get into position. She is chilling, reading the gossip mags about the prince and his seven wives and how they're all like, oh man, this guy is horrible. And his mother is like, I agree with the women. And she is like, wow, that's really messed up. You must have done something really terrible. Eventually the HIV gets there and it gets in place and it's looking after the harvesters, which are the machines that she is supposed to blow up. Once it's in place, she's like, okay, now it's time to go meet up with Martin. And she goes to a park. And and it's just like a park here, except it doesn't have any gravity. It has grass, it has trees, it has oxygen, and people play around and romp around and, you know, walk their dogs and meet people in there. She goes there and she is talking with the groundskeeper there, and she's like, now, now help me out with something. You came all the way to the moon to work on grass? <laughs> He's like, I like plants. Plus the moon has lighter gravity so I can work with my joints. Not being all messed up like they are down on Earth. She says, oh, okay, fair point. And he makes a whole bunch of no smoking references, and then Martin shows up. And when Martin shows up, he says, no boinking on the grass. And she says, what are you taking for? And he says, no boinking on the grass. And so she's like, okay. And Martin and her go off into a secluded area so that he can give her the machine that he had created for her. Martin makes some jokes like, you're my only friend with boobs. And she's like, you really need to learn how to talk to women. I can do that for you. I can help you. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I wish the men were better written in this book. <laughs> <laughs> but she gets the device from him and takes it home and then she starts prepping for her moonwalk across the moon and she's getting all of her gear ready. She's getting the tools that she got from her father and putting it in a rucksack, putting it all into a scooter type machine to take her out there and getting all the oxygen reserves on the scooter type machine. It's all very technical, very well thought out, very well described, but if I were to try and explain everything to you the way that he did, you wouldn't understand a word of it and I would get so much wrong. So basically she takes everything that she has, she puts it in a cart and she takes the cart out to the harvesters. Once she gets out to her first harvester, she decides that she's going to hijack it. She's going to take it over and she shuts it down momentarily and she gets all of her tools and puts it in the harvester and leaves her scooter behind and then takes the harvester out to the others. As she is getting ready to leave, she turns around and she's like, Oh, my reserve oxygen tanks. And as soon as she turns around, this giant moon boulder goes crunch right onto her oxygen reserves. And she's like, well, fuck. I would say a different word, but she swears like a soldier. She's like calculating how much time do I have? Is everything all right? She decides that yes, she still has time. She's just going to have to bump up her timeline a bit because she was originally going to start working on the harvesters when most people would have been asleep, but now she has to work on it now, but she surmises that she can still do it. So she gets to the harvesters and she starts working on them and she starts building little bombs to blow up the harvesters. At the same time that she is setting up these bombs, she activates the device that Martin had built for her. And the device that Martin had built for her is sitting back in her coffin and sitting on her tablet and her computer. And it is surfing the net. It is watching all the crazy cat videos on YouTube. It is watching everything. It is reading all the gossip rags. It is giving her some kind of alibi for the time of which she is doing this. She can say, I was surfing the net. And they could look at her records and say, oh yes, she was surfing the net. And that's pretty much where where the first chapter ends except for the letters. And the letters are starting to get a little hit and miss with me. This one is mostly about how her boyfriend that she happened to be living with turned out to be a pedophile. And how they don't actually have any laws about that on the moon, but 
there are groups of people who will go around and beat the crap out of you if they don't agree with what you're doing. And pedophilia definitely is not something that a lot of people agree with. So her boyfriend gets chased out of their place. She runs away from her boyfriend because she doesn't want to be associated with him anymore. But she doesn't want to go back to her father, so she's pretty much homeless. And it's just kind of like, oh... God, why? The letters were such a great mechanic when this first started. Now they're starting to drain on me. The next chapter starts. She is finishing up her first bomb. She walks away and she gets spotted by a rogue harvester that just kind of looks at her and she's like, hello? And it's like, beep, beep. And she's like, hello? And it's like, beep, beep, beep. And she's like, oh my gosh. There's someone monitoring me through that harvester. And so she is like running around trying to hide from it. She goes, I need to stop you from looking at me. So I'm going to disable you. And she climbs on the back of it. And so it's working up the wires and pulls out all the, ro the wrong wires and makes sure that it's dead. And then she goes back to work on her little bomb experiment. And she's setting up the bombs and it's all well thought out just like before. And it's all well explained just like before. But if I were to try and do it, it would hurt my brain and it would be incredibly wrong. So read that part. And she sets all of the mechanics up. Then she decides she's going to blow it up. And she runs behind a rock and boom, boom the harvester explodes. But... She wasn't exactly ready for that big of an explosion. And so when it exploded and everything went everywhere, she was like, oh my god, that was really big. And she was hiding behind, I believe it was a, a metal shelf of some kind. Then she forgets about all the shrapnel that's going to come raining down on her. She's like, oh my god, there's a lot of shrapnel. And everything falls down around her like bullets. And she's like, oh my god, there is so much stuff going on right now. And she goes and she decides that she's going to need to knock out the last two at the same time. And she even leaves her dad's tools there. And she decides that the explosion was that big, it will destroy the tools and it will will destroy the label on the tools so that people won't know that it's actually him. And she says, with a million slugs, I could actually buy him new equipment. He'll be happy to have new equipment. <laughs> she sets up the bombs to go off, like, not at the same time, but one and then the other. And then she hides behind the rock again, and the first bomb explodes, and she's hiding, 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 and she's hiding. And she looks over her shoulder. <laughs> She's waiting. And then she walks over to the other harvester and she finds out that the first explosion had actually disabled her bomb for the second explosion. And she's like, oh, damn it. But at the same time, the crew that had been monitoring her was on the way and they were on her tail. And she's like, oh, I don't have time to blow this thing up. But if I don't blow it up, I won't get the million slugs. But oh, if I get caught, oh, I'm, I'm being sent back to Earth. There's no question about it. So I just have to, I have to run. I have to run as fast as I can. And so she starts running. She starts hopping from rock to rock so that she doesn't leave dusty footprints for them to follow. She hides behind the shadow and the people actually pass her by and they don't even realize that she's not there anymore. But she still has to find a way to get back into the city because all they're going to do once they get back to the city is pretty much block all the airlocks. The only way for her to get back in is through those airlocks. And so she's like, well, they're gonna beat me there. So I have another idea. And she hops on the train, on the side of the train, and she rides it all to the visitor center. She's like, oh, please don't let anyone be guarding the, the airlocks at the visitor center. Please, 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 please. And she goes there and she realizes that there's no possible way for anyone to be monitoring those because everyone went to the city to block those airlocks. She goes to the visitor center and she takes off her mask and everything. And she's cleaning up her equipment and she's like, I'll just put this in my locker. People, it won't be a problem. She goes through the door and there's this guy named Dale. I think Dale was the guy at the beginning who was like, you suck. And she's like, fuck you. <laughs> but I could be wrong. That's pretty much how the chapter ends except for the letters. And the letters start explaining that, oh, she's so much better after being homeless. She's met this great guy named Tyler. And she's so much better because of a guy named Dale. 
which I'm assuming is the same Dale. And Dale actually gave her money, and Dale actually helped her to get back on her feet, and she's like, I am so grateful for Dale. So hopefully in the next section, Dale will happen to be an ally to her. Cause if not, she's pretty fucked. <laughs> Yeah. The letters also describe how she found someone to send stuff back to her. Send contraband to the moon. Because it turns out that the person that she is writing to actually works in the facility that packages the stuff to go to the moon. So, yeah. There you go. And that's pretty much where the section ends. Uh, this, the story's getting really good, but the letters are shining to greet. Not starting, but they're just continuing to greet. And I hope they get back to that great mechanic of being a way to describe her world more than being a way for her to bitch about being tiny and young and stupid. Because that kind of sucks. If you like what I'm doing, go ahead and click the subscribe button. If you like this video specifically, go ahead and click the like button. And go ahead and leave a comment letting me know how you feel about these letters. Because they're starting to grate on me. Oh. I've been Ali the Purple Air Doofus. This has been Buddyries reminding you to watch your pajama radius. And I will see you all in the next section of Artemis by Andy Weir. Toodles!